Hello, and thank you for watching this lecture on Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book 4. And this is Professor Ryan Paul of A&M University, Kingsville. In the 2004 translation published by Norton that I'm using, uh, translated by Charles Martin, Book 4 is called Spinning Yarns and Weaving Tales. With Book 4, we switch perspectives. We switch over to those who are opposed to Bacchus momentarily, and the narrator takes on their attitudes. Um, so the point of view is that of the Daughters of Minyas, a group of women who do not celebrate the Bacchic rites. And we get them as our narrators briefly as they tell a number of stories. What's going on is that there's a festival to Bacchus going on outside. We get a description of that, and it's an ecstatic and wild celebration of Bacchus with celebration, with uh, drinking and dancing and music. And the failure to comply risks the wrath of the god. But these women, the daughters of Minyas, they don't comply. Here's part of the hymn to Bacchus. O youth undimmed, eternal boy, fairest in the heavens, your revelers collapse in laughter. Intoxicating clamor trails you upon your rambles. The ululations of your horde, their tambourines and cymbals. So this is only part of the song. Also, it celebrates his power, those he's destroyed, those he's helped. But it also talks about the, uh, uh, the nature of the celebration itself, the nature of the festival, that it's a wild party-like uh, celebration. While the other women are out celebrating, the daughters of Minyas stay at their, quote, women's work. They're, they're weaving, they're using their yarn, they're sewing, right? So we might compare them uh, to other notable women we've seen, such as Penelope and her use of women's work. And these daughters are devoted to Pallas Athena, and they decide to tell some stories or spin yarns in order to pass the time. And they say, though other women cease their work and hasten to his concocted rites, a superior divinity has kept us in our places, Pallas Athena. So we get this sense that there's a rivalry between Bacchus and the older gods, that Bacchus is kind of a new um, and revolutionary, rebellious god. So some questions to consider. Um, the metaphor of a story as a yarn and all the sort of related images that you've probably all heard, it's very familiar. It's almost even cliche as spinning yarns, things like that. But what does it really mean? What is the significance of that analogy between weaving and storytelling? How are they like one another? How are these two actions like one another and vice versa? Um, what are the threads that make up a story? And how are they woven together? So really think about why Ovid is playing on this metaphor of spinning as a way of telling a story. You're spinning out the storyline. You're spinning out the yarn. You're weaving it together. The, yarn, the threads are crossing over one another and against each other, yet that is holding them together. How is that like a story or a myth? The first story that the daughters tell to pass their time is that of Pyramus and Thisbe, a famous one that those of you who've studied Shakespeare might know. Uh, these are the two most beautiful youths of Babylon, and they are neighbors, uh, but they are forbidden by their parents to love one another. But between their two uh, homes, between their estates of their families, is a wall that has a slight crack in it. And so it's through this crack that they try to communicate. And so it's a story of young love that's been thwarted, and we see their futile attempts at communicating with one another. These lovers had no go-between, yet managed a silent conversation with the signs and gestures they alone could understand. Their fire burned more hotly, being hidden. O oh, grudging wall, they cried, why must you block us? Is it too much to ask you to let lovers embrace without impediment of stone? So we see their attempts to communicate with each other, yet they're always being blocked. That connection, that final consummation of their relationship is prevented. 
So they come up with a plan, of course, to elope in the night, to run off together. And they designate as their, as their meeting point the tomb of Ninus. So we might ask ourselves, um, this is, you know, again, almost cliche, but there's a place where cliches come from, and this is it in some sense. Um, why that connection between a place of death, the tomb, and the beginning of their new life and marriage together, that odd conjunction of death and life, death and love that we see here and in so many other stories. What is going on there? What is that saying about the way we think and the way we associate these ideas in our minds, in our cultures? The fateful night comes and Thisbe arrives first, but she stumbles upon a lioness that has just finished making its kill. So Thisbe, of course, flees from the lioness, but drops her cloak behind her. You can see where this is likely to be going. Pyramus finds the cloak that the lion has now uh, ripped it, put it in its mouth and gotten blood all over. So he thinks that the lion has killed Thisbe. And so in his grief, he commits suicide because he cannot bear to be without his loved one. And Pyramus cries out, come now, you lions inhabiting the caves beneath this rock. Tear me to pieces and consume me quite. But only cowards merely beg for death. Drink my blood now, he says, drawing his sword and thrusting it at once in his own guts. A fatal blow. Dying, he draws the blade out of his burning wound, and his lifeblood follows it, jetting high into the air. So we have this ecstatic, climactic moment of suicide, of death, um, on Pyramus's part, where he gets to, uh, in death, consummate and express the love that he never got to experience in life. And of course, Thisbe returns to find her lover's corpse now and um, in her grief commits suicide using her lover's own blade. And their blood stains the fruit of the mulberry tree that shades them and now it will forever memorialize them. So we have a, a neat, if tragic, um, resolution to the problem of thwarted love the two are together and in death and memorialized in forevermore in the fruit of the mulberry tree. And here are some of Thisbe's last words. Death once had strength to keep us separate. It cannot keep me now from joining you. And may our wretched parents, mine and yours, be moved by this petition to allow us, joined in the same last hour by unwavering love, to lie together in a single tomb. So even in life, if they could not be together, they have a consummation in death. So some questions. Um, this is a very familiar story, even if you haven't read it before, because so many of the elements have been reused in other stories. So what aspects of the Pyramus and Thisbe story seem most familiar or even cliche? Um, when looking at the specifics of this story, what objects or images, like the wall, for example, the lioness, what are the most important? Which are the ones that seem to be symbolic and have some sort of meaning beyond their literal meaning in the story? And what is the function of those objects? What do they do in the story? And what ideas are associated with them, both literal and figurative? So thinking about the wall, for example, literally it blocks them, it figuratively blocks them, yet at the same time it is, allows some communication without full connection. So it's sort of paradoxical in that way. So think about those images. And then what are the most unusual or unexpected pairings of images or ideas? So for example, the idea of being joined in death is unusual. Um, the idea of uh, uh, the tomb as the meeting place to begin a new life is unusual. So think about what paradoxical or strange images might be used here and what is created from the friction of those strange and unexpected combinations.
the girls tell another story, um, the story of Mars and Venus. And here we have Ovid uh, retelling a story that we've already read from the Odyssey. And it's about the sun witnesses Mars and Venus having an affair. And so he tells Vulcan, who is Venus's husband. We've seen this story again, just with different names. So in order to trap the two, Vulcan forges an invisible net of the most finely wrought bronze, puts it in the bed, and then when Mars and Venus are there, he traps the two lovers and then shows them off. He displays his catch to the other immortal gods, and they all laugh and laugh, and one even jokes, hey, I wouldn't mind being caught if it was in that situation that is caught with um, with Venus. And that's the end of the story. It's much briefer than Homer's version. So questions, what are the differences between this version of the story and the version that Homer tells? Um, what's left out, most in, importantly here? What are all the things that he leaves out, Ovid leaves out from the story? And what's significant about those differences? Does it change the way we react or interpret the story? Do they change its meaning by leaving out uh, some of these details? And Venus, in her anger, though, she decides that she's going to get payback on the sun for her humiliation. So she says love is going to be uh, the, his, his downfall. Love is going to cause him pain. Um, and so it just so happens that the sun, that is Apollo, falls in love with the virgin Leucothoe. And the story follows the very familiar pattern. He visits her in disguise, this time as her mother and then reveals himself in his glory, of course not perhaps his full glory, but reveals his identity to her when alone. And she, out of fear, uh, gives in to his advances. So we have, again, another forced sexual encounter from a god. In the meantime, Clyte, who is a uh, former lover of the sun, is angry and jealous that her lover has spurned her. So she announces to everyone uh, around town what has happened, that he has now made love to Leucothoe, the princess. And as a result, Leucothoe's father grows enraged with his daughter and buries her alive, uh, of course, thus killing her um, in his anger. And here is the description of her father's wrath. Like a savage beast, he mercilessly scorns his daughter's pleas her hands uplifted to the sun in prayer, and her own explanation of events. He plundered me. I did not pleasure him. So we see the tragedy of this poor woman who was first uh, raped, essentially, by the sun, and then punished for it uh, uh, by her father. So she's been uh, humiliated and, and debased and insulted uh, and physically harmed by two different men. Um, so it's a rather tragic outcome for poor Leucothoe. And the son attempts to rescue her, melt away her tomb, but he can't revive her. He cannot bring her back. Uh, so grasping her body, he anoints it, and, and it dissipates, transforms into earth-delighting odors that ascend up to heaven um, as well as into the earth below. So she has this um, sort of afterlife as this beautiful... Uh, momentary scent, momentary experience. And for her part, Clyte goes mad with grief that she cannot be with the sun, and she falls into a trance where she just gazes upon the sun. That's her only movement, is to follow its uh, path across the sky. And eventually she is transformed into a plant with a small flower that is always turned towards the sun. And as the sisters are telling stories, one says, uh, well, what will I tell? What should I tell? And she gives a whole list of stories that she's not going to tell. And then says, what I will tell you about is the fountain of Salmasis. How the fountain gained the power that it has, which is, as she describes it, quote, to effeminate, effeminate the limbs of any man who bathes in it. So in other words, to turn a man into a woman 
um, how did it gain that power? So we're introduced to first the child of Venus and Mercury, and we're told that he is named after his parents. Um, Ovid is making a small joke here. Um, he's not named after them, their Roman names, Mercury and Venus, named after their Greek names, Hermes and Aphrodite, that is Hermaphroditus. So uh, there's, and there's perhaps another sort of linguistic joke going on in the original Latin that I'm not aware of, but um, that is part of the humor that Ovid is uh, uh, getting at in this story. And after we're introduced to Hermaphroditus, we're told about the nymph Salmasus, who, while the others liked to go hunting and, and throw the javelin and shoot the bow, um, she preferred to make herself beautiful. And once she saw the beautiful boy Hermaphroditus, and of course, immediately became consumed with lust for him. But she would not choose javelin or bow or interrupt her leisure for the chase for she would rather bathe her shapely limbs and then spend hours working on her hair, using the waters as a mirror to reflect the look that made her look most lovely. One day, while so engaged, she saw the boy and realized that she just had to have him. So she approaches him um, and comes on to him, but he's a bit embarrassed and shy by her advances because of his inexperience. And she keeps trying to kiss him, but eventually he threatens to leave because she gets just a bit too aggressive with her come-ons. Part of her line to him was, if you're already promised to another, if that's the case, I'll bed you secretly. But if there is no other, I would be the one to share a wedding couch with you. The nymph kept pestering him for a kiss. Stop that, he said, or I'll leave you here alone. So Salmasa says, She's going to leave. She pretends to leave, but she hides and watches Hermaphroditus bathe. And uh, she watches him and sees him nude and becomes so overwhelmed that eventually she has to dive into the pool and grab at him uh, in order to make love to him. And of course, he struggles to free himself, but she asks the gods to make sure that they never part. And so the gods agree and their bodies are morphed into one, a being that is described as being neither yet both man and woman. Here's her calling out, willful boy, you can resist me, but you can't escape. O oh gods, so order it that from this day he will not part from me, nor I from him. Her wish was granted, their two bodies blent, both face and figure to a single form. So when a twig is grafted to a tree, they join together in maturity. And for his part, Hermaphroditus begs his parents for one consolation, that they make the pool in which he is uh, have the power that any other man that bathes in it will similarly be transformed. And I'm not sure why that's exactly a boon for Hermaphroditus, but that's what he wants, even though it seems like sort of a, a jerk move given that that pool now is going to be transforming everyone who bathes in it. But that is how the fountain got its power. So some questions. Um, what is unusual, although not unique, about the love affair in this story? And at least part of that is the answer to the question, who is the aggressor and who is the victim in this story? And how is that different from what we've seen in most of the metamorphoses? Um, does Salmasus earlier character the, that's described at the first part of the story, does that predict her reaction to Hermaphroditus? And, and how does it, if you think it does, how does it make that prediction? What's the connection between her character and her later reaction? What's the relationship between Hermaphroditus, his earlier behavior when he first uh, uh, meets her, and the transformation that he ultimately undergoes? Is there some sort of poetic justice or irony there? How is their fate fitting for each of them in terms of their character?
And now that we've heard a number of stories from the daughters of Minyas, we now um, fade back into the larger narrative and we see that Bacchus strikes back, does not allow them to get away with um, uh, dishonoring his celebration. So their tapestries and yarns burst into living plants and their torches flare up, sending frightening shadows all about their home as the, the girls flee through the house. And so the daughters are transformed into bats so they can speak to each other and their little secrets in little squeaks, high-pitched noises. That's the fitting poetic end uh, to their profanement of Bacchus's celebration. The great fame of Bacchus has led his uh, foster mother, Ino, the sister of his actual mother, to be very proud of herself. Her and her family are very proud, and Juno is, of course, rather jealous of this. So she descends into Hades, um, and she asks for Tisiphone, or Tisophany, to help her. Um, and Tisophany is one of the daughters of night. And we get a glimpse of part of uh, the underworld. And remember, most of the underworld was just, it was not in, in Greek or Roman thought uh, n entirely a place of punishment, although some punishment occurred there. It was just a place for the dead to be, um, those that were punished as well as those that were just dead. Uh, but we do get a description of some of the torture grounds in the underworld. This is the place where infamy is punished. Here, Titios endures evisceration, pegged down over nine acres. Here, you, Tantalus, lower your lips to the receding flood and raise them to the ever-rising fruit. Here, Sisyphus, you push or you pursue the rock that always rolls back to its place. So Tisiphone comes up to the overworld and she gets Ino and Athamas, her husband, and she drives them insane. Um, and Athamas goes so far as to murder their infant son. Here's Tisiphone uh, uh, infecting Eno, Ino and uh, Athamas. And while they stood there trembling, she poured her potion on their breasts. At once it sank into the very center of their feelings. And the horrible moment of Athamas killing his child, dementedly he stalked his wife as though she were a savage beast. Laughing at this, his infant son, Learchus, was reaching towards him with his little arms when the madman snatched him from his mother's breast and whirled him in the air just like a sling two or three times before he smashed the child's head on a rock. So the horrible tragedy of the child thinking it's all a game and laughing and reaching towards his loving father and then the father murdering the boy um, in his madness. I know is mad with grief and so she takes the child and jumps into the ocean but at Venus's behest Neptune makes them immortal gods although no one knows this uh, no one sees this only Venus and Neptune know. And Juno um, then turns Ino's mourning attendants, who are complaining about Juno's cruelty, she turns them finally to stone as punishment. It's the last little bit of her part in this story. Questions to consider. Uh, we've seen Juno get very angry before. Is there any logic behind Juno's outbursts of wrath um, here or in prior uh, moments? Is there a common theme to what angers her? to the targets of her wrath? Is there a common theme to the punishments she invents? Or to the ultimate outcome for her targets? Some of them end up pretty well miserable. Some of them end up getting rescued. And when we think of all this, is Juno significantly different in her behavior from any of the other gods and goddesses? Now, lest we forget, many of these stories that we've been reading have been uh, about Cadmus's family, um, Cadmus, the founder of Thebes. So he is oppressed by grief over all the things that have happened to his descendants. So he and his wife, Harmonia, depart from Thebes. And he asks if it was the serpent that he had slain, if it was a sacred serpent, and if that's why he's being punished. And he says, if that is what 
was the cause, then please just transform me into a serpent. And so, of course, Cadmus is transformed into a serpent. As we knew, it was a serpent sacred to Mars. Um, and Cadmus's wife, Harmonia, is also transformed into a serpent. And we learn that they crawl off to live apart from humans, but in a uh, funny little happy um, tale to the story, we learn that they're very friendly now. They're not afraid of people, and they are, as the narrator calls them, gentle dragons. And here's part of the uh, description of their transformation, um, and you'll notice that it's somewhat erotic in its language. The creature's tongue flicked lightly over her lips, and he slipped in between her cherished breasts as though he were familiar with the place, embraced her, and slid right around her neck. Those of his companions who were present were horrified, but she just calmly stroked the smooth, sleek neck of the crested dragon, and at once there were two serpents intertwined. And this mention of serpents leads us to a shift over to Perseus. And we learn that um, there were a few other people who opposed Bacchus, including Acrisius. Um, and not only did Acrisius oppose Bacchus, but he also didn't believe in Perseus, didn't believe that Perseus was the son of Jove. And um, Perseus, by the way, it was his flight over Libya that left it infested with serpents. So Ovid has a couple of odd uh, sort of lateral shifts that allow him to, to shift us over now to stories about Perseus. So we learn about Perseus traveling to the very far western end of the world in the kingdom of Atlas. And there he asks for hospitality as a guest and as a son of Jove, just as we would expect. But Atlas has heard a prophecy that someone will steal, will despoil his tree that produces golden fruit, someone claiming to be a son of Jove. So he tells Perseus to get lost, says, no, you can't stay here. Um, and as punishment, Perseus says, fine, and he pulls out the Gorgon's head, the head of Medusa, and turns Atlas to stone to a giant mountain. Then, flying over Ethiopia, Perseus sees the young virgin Andromeda, and she has been chained to a rock, and he stops to see what's going on. And while he's trying to talk to this poor, tormented girl, a giant sea beast emerges to kill the virgin. Another classic story. So Perseus says, well, I will save her, but if I save her, then I get to marry her. And so, of course, the family that's watching this, they all agree. And so Perseus fights and in a rather glorious and, and, and wonderfully described battle, kills the monster. So here we have Perseus um, making his uh, announcement. He says, if I, as Perseus, the son of Jove, and she to whom he came in a reign of gold had sought your daughter, Perseus the hero who slew the snake-haired Gorgon and was bold to take to the air, born on soaring wings, I would no doubt have been preferred to all suitors as son-in-law material. But with the gods' permission, I will try to add to these endowments by my service. The deal is that she's mine if I can save her. So not a very humble man at all. So Perseus slays the monster. And then there are the appropriate sacrifices, of course, rituals and celebrations. And then we have a lavish wedding and banquet afterwards. And at this banquet, the hosts ask Perseus how he killed Medusa. And so he gives them a brief recounting of the story. Here's part of his story. He too had once looked upon her image, but it had been reflected in the shield of bronze our hero bore in his left hand. And while sleep held Medusa and her snakes, he struck her head off. From their mother's blood sprang swift Pegasus and his brother both. And then he told more stories, just as true, of lands and seas he'd seen from high above, and of the stars his wings had whisked him past. So Perseus relates that tale and some others, but only one guest knows why it was the Medusa actually had snakes for hair. And in a very interesting uh, tail end to this uh, final story to book four, we learn why. That she, of course, had been a beautiful maiden, but had been ravished by Neptune. 
She had sought uh, sanctuary in Minerva's temple, and Minerva had given her the power, turned her snakes to hair, and given her, yeah, cur turned her hair to snakes, excuse me, um, and given her the power to turn her foes into stone as a, a, a way to punish those who were her enemies. So that's the story of how Medusa became Medusa. And again, the rather odd uh, way to end this story, uh, this selection of stories in book four. So some questions. How do the stories about Perseus, these last ones, how do they compare to the other stories we've read thus far in the Metamorphoses? Are they different in terms of subject matter or narrative style, plot structure, theme? Um, do they fit in with the kinds of stories that Ovid's been telling? Um, how or uh, why not? And how does Ovid fit them into his narrative? What aspects of these stories does he emphasize in order to get them to fit in with the, the theme of transformation that he's focusing on? So thank you for watching this lecture on book four. If you have any questions, you know how to contact me via Blackboard, phone, text, or email. And otherwise, have a good week.